All right, good evening. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church. If you would, grab your hymn book and stand. Turn to hymn number 318. My sins are gone. 318. You ask me why I'm happy, so I just tell you why, because my sins are gone. And when I meet the scoffers, you ask me where they are, I say, my sins are gone. They're underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary, has far removed that darkness is from dawn. In the sea of God, forgetfulness has given that for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. Twas at the old time altar where God came in my heart, and now my sins are gone. The Lord took full possession, and the devil did depart. I'm glad. My sins are gone. There underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary, had far removed that darkness is from dawn. In the sea of God, forgetfulness that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. Oh, I like this verse number three. Sing it out now. When Satan comes to tempt me and he tries to make me down, I say, my sins are gone. You got me into trouble, but Jesus got me out. I'm glad my sins are gone. There underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary, as far as that darkness is from dawn, in the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. I'm living now for Jesus. I'm happy night and day because my sins are gone. My soul is filled with music, with all my heart I say, I know my sins are gone. They're underneath the blood, as far removed as darkness is from dawn. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. Well, that's a good way to start a service right there. I like it. And it's wonderful that we have a Savior that has the power to deal with our sins. Because Lord knows we weren't doing a very good job at it. Amen. Uh, So thank the Lord. And good to see you tonight. We certainly had a wonderful time this morning and just rejoicing and looking forward to the Lord's blessing on the service tonight. Uh, As we mentioned this morning, and as you can see, we're uh, prepped and ready for the uh, video presentation a little later in the service. We'll probably do that. Uh, when the choir uh, comes down to join you in the congregation there. And uh, so we'll take a little break at that point and uh, and see the presentation. And so uh, we're excited. It's going to be a good night. And my, all of our cooks just uh, really, uh, really cooked up a meal, didn't they? I mean, we ate and we ate and uh, we still have plenty. So we decided, hey, we're going to do it again tonight. So uh, we've got things in the warmer next door, and we're ready for uh, some spiritual food, and then, uh, then we'll have a little snack before we go home. How about that? All right, let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for being so good to us, and Lord, it's sure been a good day to be around your people and in your house and hear the singing and the preaching of your word. Lord, our hearts are full already, and we're, we're just glad that we have another service. And, another opportunity to gather like this. And Lord, we pray for your blessing and touch upon the service. We are fully aware of the fact that this is all vain and empty without your touch, without you being the focus of it, without you being at the foundation of it. So Lord, we want to surrender and consecrate our ways to you tonight and ask you to bless the preacher as he preaches, bless the singers as they sing, bless our congregational singing, that all of it just may fit together Lord, just in your your way to uh, bring honor and glory to your name, we're thankful, as we've already said, Lord, that you uh, have power to deal with our sins. And I just want to thank you for salvation and being so good to send your son to be the savior of the world. And 
I'm glad that uh, though he's the savior of the world, uh, that uh, for that to be effective for us, we plug ourselves in and we become a whosoever believeth in him that should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you for the simplicity of salvation. Thank you for the joy of salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you can be seated. Turn to hymn number 151. We'll sing verse 1 and then verse 3, and we'll end with verse number 2. All right? Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, I as dark angels in glory. Drink and honor, give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In His arms, He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Verse number three. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. This is not normally an acapella song, but we're going to attempt it. All right, verse number two. I want you to think about those words as we sing them out on verse number two. Here we go. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. For our sins, He suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the Christ. Oh, sound it out. Sound His praises. Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Amen.
change. You know, we just get twenty six. The one stuff you got. <laughs> Jesus has been so good to me. He saved my soul and set my spirit free. He gave me peace and happiness. I never yet can quite express. I thank for all the Lord has done for me. It's been 
Amen, amen. All right, you can stand. Turn to hymn number 317. 317 is love lights the way. We'll sing the first verse and the choir will come down. 317. I've left the old paths I traveled so long. I'm happy, redeemed, and free. Of Jesus, my Lord, I sing a sweet song. His love lights the way for me. His love lights the way I travel today. I'm shouting the victory. My sadness is past. I'm happy at last. His love lights the way for me. Fellowship while the party comes. Alec, Alec, bring my computer real fast. as you're making your way back to your seat on verse number three. Each trial, Lord, come add strength to my soul and faithful I'll ever be. The billows of grace now over me roll. His love lights the way for me. His love lights the way I travel today. I'm shouting the victory. My sadness is past. I'm happy at last. His love lights the way for me. Hey, man, you can be seated. All right. Amen. Well, we have the uh, video presentation, so I'm going to ask Brother Myers if you would uh, go ahead and come. Come up and uh, be ready to introduce the uh, the video for us. And as we, we get settled in, let me mention after this, of course, we'll get back to our regular uh, schedule and have our offering and so forth. And uh, Brother Myers, you come on, come on up and introduce the video for us. Um, so uh, be ready for that. If you need to get ready for the offering, you know, maybe write a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand dollar check or something like that. You can you can take care of that during the video time. Amen. And uh, but uh, we will receive the offering after the video presentation and after the video, Brother Myers will uh, open the floor for questions, things that you see and uh, th just questions that you might have about the ministry there. 
uh, and uh, so uh, we'll we'll spend give you some time and opportunity to ask some questions after the video. And uh, so, Brother Myers, you come and introduce that. Are you just ready to go? Okay, we're ready to go with the video. So we're just going to go with the video, and then he'll come after that and uh, open the floor for questions and and so forth. All right, all right. We need to catch the lights there for us. And do you need these lights too, Brother Josh? <laughs> Just the name Africa stirs the mind with excitement. Certainly a place of great wonder, beauties, and diversity. South Africa is especially known for the big five. The lion, leopard, rhino, elephant, and the African buffalo. We've actually held a lion cub. We're able to pet a rhino and walk with an elephant. South Africa is rich in great histories, peoples, and tribes. God began working on my heart to do more than just encouraging and financing missionaries. He used John 4.35 to lead us to the mission field. Say ye not there four months, then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. We surrendered as missionaries to Africa, serving in Uganda for 10 years, and now the last 15 years in South Africa. We've had the opportunity to befriend its people to love and reach them for the Lord Jesus Christ, start churches, and even the privilege of being adopted into a Ugandan family in the Japadola tribe. Africa has developed quite a bit since our first arrival. However, some probably still imagine Karen and I lived in or near the bush, or that this would be our typical daily commute to church and visitation, even that our living conditions would also be roughing it. Occasionally, we have the privilege to enjoy the real Africa as we visit a wildlife park. The real beauty and value of South Africa is the city of Pretoria. It is the executive capital of South Africa with a population of over 2.5 million. This city is well represented by all the peoples of South Africa and the international community too. 135 embassies are located in Pretoria. The only place with more embassies is Washington, D.C. Located in the Pretoria and surrounding areas, there are only two independent Baptist churches. One is a deaf church located in the downtown area, and our church, Independent Baptist Church, planted five years ago. Our last annual Jacaranda Soul Winning Day saw over 95 people come for soul winning, with 50 souls being saved and four different churches represented. The group was divided into four teams. One group went street preaching downtown, another door knocking, another did track drop, and the fourth group went into one of the Pretoria City Parks to witness. IBC currently rents a small hall in Colbane, East Pretoria. We are currently looking for property in order to build. The hall is only available to us on Wednesday night and all day Sunday. In order to grow and expand the church's ministries, we are going to need our own properties. Some of our ministries are children's Sunday school and nursery, track drop to every door in a six mile radius, the annual Jacaranda Soul Winning Day, Capital Soul Winning, which is mission trips to the capitals of four neighboring countries, all within a four hour drive, area soul winning trips to townships and local areas with a heart to start new churches. IBC has a three-year university-level Bible Institute called Faith Bible Institute, with 22 students currently enrolled this semester. Nine are scheduled to graduate at the end of the year. Sunlight is our Bible Correspondence Ministry. Over the years, we have enrolled well over 4,000 students from all walks of life and prisons across South Africa. Our last container of scripture arrived three years ago. Even with the global shutdowns, we have distributed nearly the whole container. We will be in need of more scriptures very soon. Pray with us about the Lord meeting this need of getting the word of God to South Africa. Since our last DVD presentation, I have visited Uganda twice. The first time was to visit each of our village churches, and this last time for a Bible conference. What a joy to have four men from our church here in Pretoria take this missions trip with me. It thrilled my heart to hear two of them preach in the conference. 
and also for the men to meet and hear from the hearts of you godly pastors. The conference was filled with great preaching. There should be no darkness whatsoever. A total of 20 churches and pastors were represented. During the two-day conference, three responded to the invitation and trusted the Lord in salvation. Eleven followed the Lord in believers' baptism. Seven more trusted the Lord during soul winning. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 17, Not because I desire a gift, but a desire of fruit that may abound to your account. Thank you for your part, not only in our lives, but also in the lives of South Africans and Ugandans. May the Lord richly bless you, and so much more to your account in eternity. To learn more about Karen and I and our ministries, you can find us on Facebook or live stream on YouTube by simply typing Independent Baptist Church, Pretoria. The following are our personal and church websites. We were able to come home and get our three-year visas, which is the second time. It's been an absolute miracle to get those. It would take a long time to explain. If I was to brag on Jesus tonight, it would take a couple of hours exactly where we are, the church, how God has moved, and how God has worked. Uh, however, let me just give you an update of where we are right this moment. We, uh, we came home to get the visas. We came home in May, the end of May, when our visas expired. And uh, they told us, because they rewrote the, two, the laws over the two years of COVID, that it would take up to 10 months before we'd get permission to get our, our, get, uh, our visas renewed. Uh, we prayed about that. It took three months. Amen. Amen. But I had to get back to South Africa because I had two weddings. I had nine graduating from Bible Institute and other things that were going on. And uh, then they, I took my passports to Washington. I gave it to them. They didn't call me. They kept my passports over the weekend. I missed my flight on Monday. So we had the delay. So we've been to, we've been to South Africa and we've been back. And uh, everything is just set this year for when we get back to 15th of March. We're looking forward to that. Uh, IBC hired its first time full-time employee uh, while we were there in December. And so Keanu Samuels, he is called of God. And that's a long story how God's worked in his heart, where this young man came from. And uh, our church has given him the challenge of starting a youth department and in four years he can establish a youth department and win someone or train someone to take his place that our church will stand behind him financially to start another church in South Africa someplace and so we're excited about that you say you mean you've been in church five and a half years and you don't have a youth department that's exactly right why we don't have any teenagers I'm the oldest dude in church we have a young church in their early 20s, probably average age is about 25 to 28. And so we just now get some young people growing up, 11, 12, and 13. And we're going to start in that group and then grow our youth department into our church, of course, use it for evangelism. And then because we got our visas, Shane Tasker was willing to take the reins of the church if we didn't get our visas and become the pastor. But God has put upon his heart to go to Congo. And so... I told him, I said, look, in Pretoria, they shoot words, but in Congo, they actually shoot bullets. And so be sure where God's leader, leading you. He's taking a survey trip in April and uh, beginning his full-time deputation in May to go to the country of Congo. He'll be going into western Uganda and then ministering across the border into some of the Congolese refugee camps. He'll be with Brother Tony. While Brother Tony Stark is there as well, he's got some contacts. I've already spoke to Brother Stark and Brother Shane. And so this is a first in our ministry. I've trained pastors. I've seen churches started. This is my first international missionary out of our church. And our church is going to be what Madison Baptist Church is to us. We're going to be a sending agency, is support all of that right of the local church. We're excited about that. Our church is uh, not a big church, but it's an unusual church. And so we're actually looking at ne next week or so, uh, some of them are going to be looking at some property, and we hope to buy our property sometime this year. And so, but then pray for me because this is going to be tough. Missionaries work themselves out of jobs. 
And so by the time we come home in the next couple of years for a full furlough, we'll be turning this ministry over. So you pray for us as we do that in God's leadership. All right, if you have a question, anything and everything you always wanted to ask a missionary, but until the night you were too afraid, let me have it. <laughs> Anybody have any question particular about our ministry? We, we try to be explanatory. Yes, sir. Uh, probably about $7 a gallon. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. It's expensive. All right. Somebody else have a question? Yes, sir. Horribly expensive. Um, Pretoria would be like being in Washington, D.C. You know, the key word for South Africa is complicated. We have three capitals. We don't just have Washington. We have uh, Pretoria's executive capital, the presidency. Cape Town is the uh, judicial, where the parliament is, and uh, Bloemfontein, which is an hour, an hour and a half south of us, is where the judicial capital is. And so it is very expensive. Not like it would be buying Washington, D.C. property, but when you look at the earnings of people. So our church has right now uh, about two million in the bank, and that's two million rand, about $120,000. So we are just at the cusp of getting into a piece of land. But the problem there is churches are not exempt. So when you buy a piece of land, they charge you for whatever kind of house should be on it or building should be on it. You begin paying taxes immediately, and that's sometimes up to $1,000 a month. Wow. So, yeah, it's, uh, but there hasn't been a church built in the municipalities that is in a white area or in an affluent area in over 20 years in South Africa. Not an independent Baptist church. Wow. So we're we're treading on some new ground. We need prayer. I just find ask we need prayer. Yes, sir, in the back. What, what is like to South and what it really isn't much. I mean, you know, we, we go out on the streets every Saturday morning, uh, every Saturday morning soul winning. We cannot go into the houses. We cannot, you, you know, everything is barbed wire, electric fence, or palisade fencing around. Uh, you can beat on the gate. You'll see the curtain move, and that's it. They won't answer it. They don't know who you are. It's not a. It's not a time, and so literally we have to go out and put things in the mailboxes, which is legal, by the way. We put things in the mailboxes, and this is nice, by the way. And so then we talk to people that are out, and uh, we just you know we strike up conversations just like you would soul winning here in the states. Um, the only group that's very difficult to work with is the. Uh, offer Connors because they are taught that anybody who street preaches or passes out a gospel track or talks about Christ outside of four walls of church is a cult. And so that's the white South African. And 40% of Pretoria is white South Africans. It's a high, I mean, the, the population is 85 black, 15% white. But the city of Pretoria as a municipality has the greatest white population. And that's one of the reasons why I said, I don't, I don't want to go to Pretoria. What am I going to do with that? But uh, it's been a, more of a cosmopolitan city. Okay. All right. Somebody else have a question? Yes, sir. I don't find any problems, really. I mean, when I first went um, 15 years, 16 years ago, uh, it seemed like it was Mississippi back as soon as, uh, you know, the Civil Rights Act was passed. Like kind of that undertow tension was there. But PE is different than Pretoria. And, you know, it's, it, it, what happens is, is when under apartheid, they actually took the CBD, the city centers, and those were the white populations. Then they pushed outside of that the Asian populations. And they pushed outside of that further away from town, the colored population. Then they pushed out further from that the black population. Okay? So PE, where we're at 10 years, was still very segregated. Now, not in jobs or all of that, but in there where they lived. Okay, Pretoria is not that way. I live in a, I, I live in a mansion, but the people that own the house is charter members of our church, IBC, and he's the first secretary to the UN for South Africa. So he's on a diplomatic mission to the UN in New York. Pray for him. He's in a foreign country, and um, we're taking care of his house. So all we're having to pay is his HOA fees and that. And probably ninety percent of the complex that we live in is black. And, you know, our church, we have five of the black tribes represented on Sunday morning. We have three of the white tribes. 
I joke about that because they're the Dutch background, they're the British descent, and then I'm an American. I'm not either one of those tribes. And uh, then we have foreigners. We have Zimbabwe, we have uh, had Malawi, we've had others come. So on Sunday morning, it could be nine languages. So it's a very, very, very diverse church. Amen. All right. Get Captain. <laughs> I, was at Mad I was at Madison Baptist Church and somebody walked by me and said, you look like you've caught that deadly, incurable, highly contagious disease. I said, yeah, what's that? I said, A-G-E. <laughs> Amen. Yes, ma'am. We don't have any really active cults that you just kind of notice, uh, you know, no signs or that. We have a lot of psychic readers that are there. But the, the problem in South Africa is the ancestor worship, which is typically around the South African black tribes. Uh, no matter what, they still hang on to those things. We, we really had much more demonic, much more oppression in Uganda than we did anywhere in South Africa, much like living in America to us. Uh, but South Africa, we dealt with goat head in the yard. We dealt with human heads from the witch doctors and that, yeah. When we first moved to Toro, our um, witch doctor lived right next to us. Praise the Lord, after about 15 years, the men led her to Jesus Christ just before she died too. Amen. All right. Yes, sir. Well, now the greatest need we have is scripture. We, um, the, we, Brother Bobby at BNL Bible Literature Missionary Foundation, we've always been a part of our ministry. We've always taken scriptures, whether it's in our suitcases or whether uh, we shipped our own containers or personal things. We always had scripture and tracts. He challenged me several years back to step out on greater faith. So we have taken so far two twenties and a forty container filled with scripture. And next week or week after next, I'll be speaking to him about another container. He'd be already printing it right now. There's no way I get my visas in that. It cost seven thousand dollars to ship that last time. This time it's going to cost. I've been told fourteen thousand. Yeah, you know the Bible says, "Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established." Yep. And so I, I commit the works, and then God just takes care of everything else. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Everyone in our church speaks English perfectly, fluently. Yes, ma'am. Very, very strange. It really is. And uh, I just love it. And people visit our church, they, they go away and they say, it's a warm church. You people really do love each other. We've got, uh, just to give you an idea, we've have, uh, we have medical students. I have a young man now that's going to be moving from our church to Cape Town. He has a PhD in climatology. He works for the UN. Uh, my landlord, our charter member, works in the UN in New York. And we've got people that scrub toilets and wash sinks. We've got people who uh, work on the streets. I mean, we've got rich, we've got poor, we've got educated, we've got uneducated. Uh, our chiropractic doctor, member of our church, was also assassin hired by the CIA years ago. It's like, this is, <laughs> wow, you know, I, I, I'm a blue collar guy. I mean, you know, put me in a city or somewhere toward the country, you know, where people work, and I'm with PhDs and doctors. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. We typically take four things. We take the scriptures, we take full Bibles, we take New Testaments, and we take John and Romans. Of course, we take tracts, but that's secondary because we can print the tracts over there. It's the scriptures that we cannot print. So the Bibles are just Bibles, but um, the New Testaments, we've particularly used those to go into schools. Um, when I was in PE, we got in almost 60 different schools, anywhere from two or 300 students to 2,000 students, distributing the New Testaments. And because we did that, I could speak in the assemblies and give the gospel. Uh, Pretoria is too close to the Department of Education. I can't get into them. I get in some of the township schools. So that's what we primarily use the New Testaments for. The John of Romans, we put those in the mailboxes. And we pass those out, which are 
our personal lives with our church cover, church times, map, all of our social media, all that's on there. So we hand it to them. They have it in the language, five languages the gospel is given, and they have all the information about our church, all in one packet. Okay? So we, last time we took 95,000 of those, 3,000 Bibles, and 50,000 New Testaments. Don't know what we're taking yet. One more. Not that I know of in South Africa. I mean, you know, when you get outside the, you know, South Africa is considered a second world country. You know, we consider America a first world country, but you guys know sometimes you're in second world. Okay. I explain a second world country by the cities are third or first world and everything else is third world. And so once you get outside the cities, you'll find that it's very rural, very rugged. Um, but no one's isolated in South Africa with modern technology, cell phones, and all the rest of that. All right. Anybody else? I said last one, but just anybody else? Going once. All right. Yes, sir. Nice. <laughs> we have we have 5G when the power's on. <laughs> right now we're on load shedding stage six, which means it's off 10 and a half hours every day. And most of the time it's going to be off in the morning before you go to work and the evening when you come home from work so there's no hot water and you can't cook dinner because the power grid and the power plants are so bad. I understand when it goes to stage eight, the utility company comes in and blows your candles out. <laughs> so this is going to be a challenge. We are going to have to get a battery backup system uh, for us. And we can run a fan. It's 90 degrees right now in South Africa, and there's no air conditioning in most of the houses. So got to have a fan at night. So we're going to have to invest in something like that when we get back. All right, Pastor, you have anything else to say? All right, let's turn our Bibles tonight to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I won't give you the promise tonight that this is short because obviously that would take even longer. That seems to be a, a curse of pastors and preachers when they say that. I want to challenge you tonight, <clears throat> this morning with the men, we looked at prayer. This morning in the service, we looked at having a heart, keeping a heart that's right with God. And I think tonight, if we would continue kind of on that theme of thought, then the greatest thing our heart is going to want to do is to make Christ known. That's the title of the message, Making Christ Known. Ephesians chapter 3, stand with me if you would, and if you can, in honor of the Word of God, begin reading with me in verse 7. The Apostle Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now, under principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness with access, uh, boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Let's bow together in prayer. Again, Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessing on the Word of God. Thank you for the opportunity to stand in the pulpit with the grace that's been given by the pastor of this church. Thank you, Lord, for their years of faithful prayer, financial giving, encouragement, and even today has been kind of a family reunion. I thank you, Lord, for this church. I pray tonight you'd use me to be a blessing. I pray tonight the Word of God may go forth and honor your, your, your honor and your glory. Accomplish what you desire tonight in the service. We'll give you the honor and the glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you. You can be seated. <clears throat> I think of all the scripture, the book of Ephesians is probably one of my favorite books. Probably the one I have taught from the most. And the thing I found in the book of Ephesians, it doesn't matter how much of it you've memorized or how much of it you've studied, it seems like the more you get into it, 
the more it is. That's the Word of God. It just gets richer. It gets deeper. I want you to notice where I get the title of the message is from Ephesians chapter 3. Notice in verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, and to make men see. What are we going to make men see? Notice what he says at the end of verse 10, the manifold wisdom of God. So we're making Christ known. That's the wisdom of God. Notice the two words by in those verses. It's created all things by Jesus Christ. That includes the church. He is the head of the church. He's the founder of the church. And notice, we, to be, might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. I see in this text that our primary responsibility is the church as a believer, as a family of God, is to make Christ known. The manifold wisdom of God. Can I say tonight, let's have for a few moments a household or a family meeting. I think Paul knew that, chapter 3, verse 15, the text that I'm reading tonight. He says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. In chapter 2, at verse 19, he says, Now therefore, no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. In Galatians 6.10, he also makes the comment, says, Let us do good unto all men, especially to them that are the household of faith. I believe Apostle Paul knew what a household was, what a family was, and that's what a church is, to make Christ known. Two things I did with my children growing up. One of those was, let's go get ice cream. How many of you like ice cream? Amen. Well, I've been diabetic resistant now, so I can't have anything but sugar free. That's tough. But I realize, I've always said, if there's no ice cream in heaven, it's not heaven, or there's something a whole lot better than ice cream there. So I told my children, the key word is, let's go get ice cream. Say it just like that. And when they came to me, which my son never did that, my daughter did that several occasions, and uh, when it was key word that everything in the world stopped, my child became the most important thing to me in the world. And so when they would say, or come to me, and say, let's go get ice cream, and I was on the phone, I got off the phone. If I was counseling someone, I ended everything as quickly as I could, took my undivided attention out, and we got ice cream. Amen? That's what she said. Let's go get ice cream. So we're here sitting at Hardy's in Ardmore, Alabama, and I'm looking on my ice cream comb, these hot tears shining down her face on top of hers, the ice cream is melting all over the table, somebody said something about me, and I'm looking on mine saying, grow up, kid, it's got to get a lot worse before it's over. No, I couldn't say that to her. The other one that we did was a family conference. A family conference usually it was dressing something for the whole family that was pretty serious. and Most of the time, somebody was in kind of trouble. Or like the one when I came home from here, the next week after uh, Pastor Killian patted me on the pocket and said, God bless you, and God sealed that for my heart, that I'm going to be a missionary. And I went home to the family conference that week. He says, guess what? We're going to Uganda. And that went over really well for a while. So let's have a household meeting tonight about making Christ known. I want to share three things with you tonight. First of all, I want to share what Paul gives us here. He gives us his own personal example. I want to share number two, Paul's exhortation or his urging the church because of his example. And then I want you to notice Paul's expectation for the church. He gives us his, exa his example of his life and ministry. He gives us the urging, that exhortation. And now he has an expectation because of it for you and for me. I want you to notice, first of all, Paul's example as a minister. He says in verse 7, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Paul said, I am a minister. I am a minister of the gospel. I am literally a servant of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Acts 20, 28, Take heed therefore to yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which is purchased with His own blood. When you see that word minister tonight in Ephesians chapter 3, you think of pastor. You think of a missionary. You think of evangelist. No, your thinking is wrong. I do believe, I very much believe, as it says, take heed to yourselves as a pastor, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we ought to examine ourselves first before we lead or preach the gospel to anyone else. But here we're talking about being a servant. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 42 through 45, He makes this statement that they 
which are counted to rule over the Gentiles, exercise authority. And notice Jesus said this, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. It doesn't mean the pastor of your church. It just simply means a servant of Jesus Christ. So the greatest leader should be a servant. Paul said, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, many of Paul's epistles and many of the books that Paul wrote, regardless as they start, many of them have the word doulos. I am a servant of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, I am a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Every seven years, a prisoner would get their freedom. A slave would get their freedom. They would be in slavery, usually because they've committed a crime, they have to pay for it. Or they were indebted and gone into servitude, but after seven years, they all got their freedom. There were those who took the biblical admonition that the master should treat the servant, the slave, literally as a son. And honor goes back and forth. So there were those servants who, when they got their freedom, looked around and said, no one's ever loved me like the masters loved me. No one's ever fed me like the masters fed me. No one's ever clothed me like the masters clothed me. And if I leave the master and I go back to my own life, my lifestyle is going to be crippled. And I've got it so much better here. I'll stay here on my own free choice, in my own free volition, and serve the master. They took them to the city gate. They backed their right ear and they augured it with a hole in it to say to everyone they ever saw, I have decided to give my life as a servant to the master. Paul said, I am a servant here in Ephesians chapter 3. But in the gospel or in, the, uh, in Paul's writings, he starts out, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. That word servant is, I'm a bond slave. I'm giving my life completely and freely to the master. Oh, more than that, chapter 4, verse 1. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Paul was not just a servant. Paul was not just a bond servant. Paul said, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. The love of Christ constrains me, Paul says. What he's saying is, is I'm in a prison. I'm a prisoner. I'm locked up. When you go look at a prisoner, you have prison ministry here. They're behind bars. They eat when the food is served. They get to go out of the cell when they're told they can go out of the cell. They don't have freedom. They're shackled. There's rules, and their life is now constrained by other authorities. Paul said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I am constrained by the Word of God. I am constrained by the love of God. I like 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 15, where Paul talked about the house of Stephanos, and he said they were addicted to the ministry. I think Paul was addicted to it. I have certainly been addicted to the ministry. I can't imagine stooping and doing anything else other than being a servant of God. So Paul was a minister. Paul also has his example, his self-esteem. Notice verse 8. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Notice he says what his self-esteem is in. It's not in himself, it's in the Lord. We have too much self-esteem. We've got too much stinking pride. That's what it is. Notice Paul says, I am less than the least of all saints. Paul didn't say, I am less than the least of the apostles. He didn't say, I am less than the least of the disciples. He said, I am less than the least of all saints. Can you imagine with me tonight, here at Bethel Baptist Church, the worst church member, this church is, don't name me any names, the worst church member that's ever been here. They don't show up, they don't tithe, they don't give, they don't shake a hand, they don't smile, they just complain. You find the worst <clears throat> carnal Christian you could find in this church. And Paul said, I'm lower than that. You, you caught that. You mean the guy that wrote two-thirds of our New Testament under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God? The guy that took three missionary journeys to have greatly used of God? He said, no, I am less than the least of all saints. He wasn't his talents or his abilities. It was in the person of Jesus Christ. When I got saved at 13 years of age, two of my aunts led me to Jesus Christ. And I went off to Bible college, and my cousin, who was two years older, my, the aunt that led me to Christ, her boy dropped out of Bible college and never fulfilled his responsibility of the call of God that was upon his life. She told my dad, she says, well, if he can't make it, Gerald's not going to make it. It caused a rift in our family. They wouldn't even speak to each other sociably, peaceably, for almost two years. Well, I made it. 
And after I got through with Bible college, I did cram five years, uh, four years into five. If you, you catch that, I was able to do that. I did finish Bible college, and I went off to Cincinnati, Ohio, as associate pastor. And my aunt that led me to Jesus Christ said, he won't make it. I left there and I went to Gaston, Alabama and I started a church. And she was a member of the church and she said, this church won't make it. I went to Ardmore and I pastored Sweet Spring Baptist Church. She said, mm, he won't make it. I went to Uganda. She said, he won't make it. I went to South Africa. She said, I haven't said anything. Now I'm worried if I'll make it. Don't be too hard on my aunt. She remembers the 13-year-old sitting on the sofa that got saved. No gifts, no talents, no ability whatsoever. It's not about who you are. It's about who God is. It's not about how big you are. It's about how big God is. And God can use you. And Paul understood that. We see Paul's example. We see as a minister, self-esteem. Notice his efforts in verse 13. He says, the Ephesian church, Wherefore I desire that you faint not in my tribulations for you, which is your glory. The church of Ephesus looked at all that Paul was going through. Their hearts were moved for him. His wasn't. In verse 8, he's preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. He's preaching, verse 11, the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. His effort was to get the message out. Did you know that's our message? Notice in chapter 4, if you would, in verse 7. He says, but unto every one of us is given the grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. As much as Paul's responsibility of making Christ known, the Ephesian church of making Christ known, it's our responsibility of making Christ known just as it was His. Yes, there's a measure of faith. Yes, there's a measure of grace that's given. I can't be your pastor. Your pastor can't be me. I can't be Tony Stark, but I can be Gerald Myers. I can be what God wants me to be, and you can be exactly who God wants you to be. Paul said in Titus 1.3, In due times is manifest the preaching of His Word, which is committed unto me. It's committed to you and I. Then notice also Paul's effectual power. We see his example as a minister. We see his example of self-esteem. We see example of his effort. Notice his power in verse 7. He says, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Paul had the power of God on his life. Now where did that come from? It came from the Word of God. This hadn't changed. This is still the same. The gospel hasn't changed. It's still the same. Standards haven't changed. They're still the same. They're eternal. A young person came up to me, was a missionary kid, an MK, came up to me in South Africa and said, Well, Myers, do you know that you're old-fashioned? I looked at him and I said, come a little closer and look a little harder. He's getting there and he's looking. and I know, a little closer, look. He's just right there looking. I said, I am the very definition of old-fashioned. Proud of it. Amen? And I asked him this question. Just how old-fashioned you think God is? He was the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. All this going around us, perversion or anything else, God does not change. Paul said, my power comes from the Word of God. That's eternal. The same Word. God said, and it happened. And it was good. God said six times, and creation was there. God has power, and the power is in the Word of God. And Paul preached the Word of God. Paul prayed. Verses 14 through 21, we're going to get there in a moment. He says, for this cause I bow my knees. And he says, amen. In verse 21, he prays. So Paul's power came from the Word of God. Paul's power came from prayer. And Paul's power came from his efforts. So he can say in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 38, all the things that Paul suffered. Probably all of us put together in this room for our entire lifetime does not even come past some of the things which the Apostle Paul did. But God used those things as well for His honor and for His glory, just like He uses them in our life. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. What an example that's set before us. Are you living up? Notice he says in chapter 4, verse 1, I beseech you that you walk worthy of his example. But I want you to notice number 2, we have Paul's example, but notice number 2, now we have Paul's exhortation. But now I have to change the outline. Why? Well, Paul's preaching to the church of Ephesus and he's giving them the Word of God. You understand what I just said? 
So the eternal Word of God is recorded for you and for I. So we see Paul's example. Now we see Paul's uh, exhortation and his expectation of the church of Ephesus. But because it's in our book right here, the Word of God, that means it's God's exhortation for you and I, and it's God's expectation for you and for I. Notice his exhortation is by prayer. Now imagine being exhorted, being challenged, to being urged to something greater and great importance. And Paul does this to the church of Ephesus by being on his knees before God, praying that they would get it, praying they would understand it and receive the exhortation, that great urging by him. He says in verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees to the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to give you four specific things from these verses that his prayer and exhortation is briefly. But before I do, I want you to understand Jesus Christ is the head of the church. There are three terms I want to share quickly with you tonight about that. He says, first of all, that we are the body of Christ. Second of all, the bride of Christ. And third of all, the temple. And that's important because it gives us an understanding of the Old Testament as well into the New Testament. The church, we are the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now ye are the body of Christ. We have been put in the body of Jesus Christ. It's been amazing to me for the last five and a half years at Independent Baptist Church, as we've grown, we've got a full-time employee, how God has brought a secretary who understands all those financials. We have a man in our church that's a certified accountant. He knows all the tax codes and all of that. And as our church has grown from its infancy, God has sent us people with the gifts and the talents and abilities in the world to meet the needs of the church. We are a body. When you get saved, you're in the body of Jesus Christ. We're not all the head, we're not all the toes, we're not all the fingers, but we are part of the body of Jesus Christ. There's no amputation and there's no abortion. Once you're in, you're in, and you're in there eternally in the body of Jesus Christ. That speaks of union with Him. Then the Bible talks about the bride, speaks of love. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 22 and verse 17, the Spirit and the Bride say, come, what an invitation. I remember years ago, October 10, 1981, my wife walked out the side door and down the aisle in her wedding dress. I'm standing there at the front and she walks in with that wedding dress on and I first thought I had was, oh boy, don't she look pretty. No, I said, did she look beautiful. She got about halfway down, and another thought, the second thought occurred to me and said, Oh boy, if you don't know what responsibility is, you just found it. And after the wedding, not only was my t shirt wet, the shirt was wet, and the suit coat was wet. That's how nervous I was when I got married. I remember when I got married. I remember when I got saved. I remember when God called me to preach. This is a love language that we love the Lord. The next one is the temple. That speaks of His glory. In the Old Testament, listen church, in the Old Testament, the glory of God, excuse the word, the glory of God came into the temple, into the tabernacle, in the wilderness, and the people of God went out to see, excuse the word, the exhibition of the Holy Spirit of God. The Shekinah glory of God. So they went to see God's glory in the tabernacle. Did you know when you and I got saved, that same Holy Spirit, that same Shekinah glory of God lives inside you and lives inside me once we got saved. Now, the world doesn't come in here to see us glow, but we are to take the temple outside and show it to them. In the Old Testament, they came to see the tabernacle. In the New Testament, you and I are the tabernacle to go out. And we are to demonstrate the glory of God. So as I speak about the church tonight in Paul's exhortation to you and I, remember that you're the body of Christ. Remember that you are the bride of Christ. Remember that you are the temple of Christ. And notice verse 16, he says, that God would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by the Spirit in His inner man. God's praying for God's glory in your life and mine. The glory of God to be exhibited there. How? In the inner man. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Though the outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. Dear believer, dear friend, dear loved one, ours, Vince Dorego, going through so many medical problems and issues. And uh, man, I, I tell you what, it's just a miracle that he's alive. And I told him, I said, Brother Vince, all I can tell you is 
Welcome to Job's world. I, I don't know anybody else that's kind of experiencing all Job's going through like you're going through. And he just laughed that off. But it's real. Going through great physical problems and trials in his life, but he still has a song. I remember years ago when I was uh, associate pastor, went to see Miss Bolton, a godly lady. I've never met a more godly lady than that lady. She got prayers answered. I'm telling you what, she knew the scripture. Pastor and I have been pastoring, pastor had been pastoring for decades, and I was just out of Bible college. We'd sit down there and she'd ask a question. We'd get up and leave. And he said, Brother Myers, you know what she's asking? I said, Man, I didn't know what the answer to the question was. I'd never even heard the question. And he said, Well, that's good. He said, I got to go home and find out what it says, too. Good answer. She's just in her Bible, buddy. I mean, what a godly saint. But she died of cancer, eat up like somebody one of Hitler's uh, concentration camps. But she always had a song. She always had a sweet testimony in her heart. No matter what we're going through, God's Spirit lives inside. There should be a song that's in our heart. There should be a joy in our heart. Notice that in verse 16. He says, God grants you according to the riches of His glory. God's not poor. And He's not going to run out. Notice the second thing in verse 17, dwelling. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that's being rooted and grounded in love. We ought to be grounded. There ought to be a foundation for our life. Rooted and grounded in love. Notice that dwelling here. Now, if I was to throw you the keys or someone threw you the keys to a million dollar home someplace in San Francisco, what would you do? Well, tonight you would probably be getting a plane ticket to go out there to put it, hopefully, up for sale. And you might not buy anything at camp after that, but anyway, that's another story. So here you go, you have this mansion, what would you do? You'd stick the key in the door, you open the door, and you'd walk in, wouldn't you? i tell you what I would do. I don't usually tell preachers I stay with when I'm in their missions or prophet, or prophet's chamber. But I'd go in, I'd look in this room, I'd look in that room, I'd look in that room, I'd look at the cupboards, I'd look at the cabinets, I'd look at the closets. Why? It's mine! I'm going to dwell in it. I'm going to go into every room. I'm going to go in and out of the room. I'm probably going to go in the basement. I might even get up in the attic and take a look at that. Why? It's mine! I'm going to dwell in it. Did you know you and I are His and He dwells in us? There is no passage law. There is no speed hump. There is no tape that says do not cross. There is no no in your life to the will of God or God's desire for you and I. He dwells there. Notice in a biblical faith, a Bible-centered belief and trust in the simple Word of God. We're missing that today. Salt's not salt, light's not light. It's changed today. It's been changing for years. But the love of many has truly waxed cold in our generation. Jesus made the comment by saying this, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? We know there's a rapture. We know people are going to get caught up. We understand that. Jesus says, not is there salvation faith, but is there Bible-believing, living faith that really lives by the Word of God. And our crowd's getting smaller, by the way. So God's glory, God's dwelling. Notice verse 18, comprehending. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and height. I'm not real good at physical science, but I recognize that if you're going to understand that, then you have to be in the middle of it. Isn't that wonderful? What a great place to be. Now, he says in verse 19, to know the love of Christ. So how can he say they might be able to comprehend something we're supposed to know? Is that a contradiction in your Bible? No, not at all. What is it? I believe it's simply God saying, you ought to want to know me more and more and more. There's a lot of things you can comprehend. When my wife came down the aisle, I didn't know her like I know her today. When she stood up here, I told her I loved her. I lied. I wasn't lying that day because... I really, as far as I knew about love, I loved her. But now after 41 years of marriage, I can tell you, I love her a whole lot different today than I loved her back then. I can't even imagine life without her. I can't really remember life before her. She's been my life. Not my partner. Not my soulmate. She is me and I am her. Two made one flesh. That's what God decides. That's what God wants for you. To know Him. And comprehend. Then verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with the fullness of God. And I just want you strengthened. He doesn't only want to dwell there. He doesn't only want the comprehension. He wants His fullness to be in our lives. 
Paul goes on and tells the church of Colossae in chapter 2 and verse 9 of Colossians, For in Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in Him. He is all you need. Now notice verse 20. We talked about that this morning. And Kathy, you weren't here, but I said that. If you know Tony Stark, you know this verse. But notice the first three-letter word in that verse. Now. You really want this verse to work in your life. There's got to be a now. God said, I expect these things from you, and if these things are true about your life, now, what does He say? Unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly of all we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. This unlocks your prayer life. This unlocks the power of God in your life. So Paul gives us his example. Paul gives us, God gives us the exhortation. Now notice Paul's expectation, God's expectation for you and I. Chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, summary statement, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you're called. Now walk right. Now apply the example. Now apply the exhortation that's been given to you through prayer. Now put it in your life. Did you know the book of Ephesians is about walking? Notice back in chapter 2, he tells us in verse 8, For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Don't stop there. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Notice the word walk in them. Can I say, I am thankful for the grace of God. I've always said, if there was one thing I had to do to go to heaven, I'd go to hell. If there was one thing I didn't, I could not do, I would do it and I'd probably end up in hell. If it was based on me, on any matter, or on you, we wouldn't go to heaven. But it's based on Jesus Christ. For by grace you're saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Notice the next two words, or next several words. We are His workmanship. Let me ask you a question. It's beautiful, and we drove into Tampa Bay earlier this week and just drove around, looked at the beauty of God's creation that's here. How beautiful it is. What a sin-cursed world we live in. Could you imagine what it looked like in the Garden of Eden? What it looked like before sin? When God created the heavens and the earth? Well, if God is working in your life and you're His workmanship after you got saved, can I ask you a question? Does God make junk? So in other words, whatever God's called for you, whatever God's given for you to do, it's His workmanship. And you'll be ready for it. And God will use you for it. You know, when Peter stepped out of the boat and he's walking on the sea, There's a lot of commentaries about all this. My personal belief is, I could be wrong when I get to heaven. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things I've been wrong about. But I believe when Peter got out on the boat and he started walking on the water, it probably occurred to Peter's mind, I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. And then the doubt began to arise in his heart. Listen, when I got saved at 13 and God called me to preach at 14 and you would tell me you're going to be a missionary in Africa and you're going to be a church planner. I'd still be under my bed. I'd be hiding under the bed. There's just no way. Why does God do that? He takes somebody who's nobody and He does something with them so He can be glorified. He can get the glory for it. Did you know God has an eternal purpose for every person sitting in this room, young and old? And God, what God has called for you, God will enable for you, God will provide for you, and God will see it through. You're His workmanship. Praise God, He's not done here. And He's not done with you either. Notice in chapter 4, verse 1, He said, we walk worthy. Notice chapter 4, verse 17, He says, not as others walk, as the other Gentiles walk. There's a way not to walk anymore. He says, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, to walk in light. Chapter 5, verse 8, He says, walk in, uh, walk in love. Chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Verse 8 talks about light. Verse, 17, uh, verse 15, notice, see then you walk circumspectly and not as fools. I met some years ago a man who was a Green Beret years ago in Vietnam, and he made the statement that they taught him how to kill a man with his bare hands 32 ways. Well, it's quite obvious I didn't ask for any demonstrations. I really didn't want to know. 
They talked about walking through the rice paddies. The first guy in the platoon would walk straight ahead, only looking straight ahead. The very last guy in the platoon would walk backwards, only looking backwards. The next guy is in the middle. One would be looking this way, walking sideways. The other guy behind him or just in front of him would be walking the other way, looking the other way. And as the first man went looking straight, the next man began looking to the sides until everyone was looking entirely around the platoon as they moved. The enemy ever popped up their heads. They might get one or two of them. But they immediately knew exactly where the enemy was at and exactly what was going on immediately if there was an ambush. That's walking circumspectly. Let me ask you, believer, are you circumspectly walking at work? Are you circumspectly walking in life? Are you looking around you to the spiritual dangers that are there? Are you conscious to those? The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I'm moving quickly. Paul's example. Paul's exhortation. God's exhortation. Paul's expectation. God's expectation. How'd they do? Pastor, my, my wife and I have, have said what a, what a blessing this church has been to us. And I believe Bethel Baptist Church and the folks that I do know here, I, I believe this is an Ephesians type church. Uh, you know, my wife and I, we're 63, next year 64, 65, when this furlough comes ahead. My pastor asked me last time we were doing the visas, he said, Brother Myers, do you think it's time for you to come home? I said, I don't believe so. He said, would you like for me to look for a church if I hear of one and let you know? I said, no. He said, okay. That was Wednesday night, Sunday morning. I walk in the lobby and Pastor Allison is there. And I said, Pastor, can I talk to you privately just for a moment? He said, sure. We're walking out. And he says, now, Brother Myers, he said, are, are you saying yes? I said, no. He said, well, what are you saying? I'm saying, I am not saying no. And he walked away saying, wise man. I'm not going to tell God no. My heart's on the field. I'd like to die there, God willing. Now, not any time soon, but now think for a moment with me. Any pastor out there who's looking for a church, any missionary that would be coming home, if they were going to pastor a church, it's probably not the church of Laodicea. It's probably not the church of Corinth they'd be looking for. They'd be looking for an Ephesians type church. But it's hard to maintain an Ephesians type church. What do I mean by that? Well, some decades later, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, God says their works were great. But there was a problem. They left their first love. They didn't lose it. They left it. And tonight, may I challenge you not to be an Ephesians church and lose your first love. You can do everything right, but it's not got the right heart. You're going to be in trouble. Does that explain the message this morning with the message tonight? Keep that heart. For out of the heart groweth the issues of life. Keep the heart right. The heart's right. We want everyone to know the Lord we know and to know Him in fullness and know Him in glory. You're a church family. Act like it. What does that mean? I don't know about you, but families have complications. Anybody got a family? Anybody had a complication? You love each other. You know, the Bible says to forbear. Just think about that word. In front of you, bearing. That means carry it. Just carry it. Carry it through. Making Christ known. That is the job of the pastor. That's the job of the missionary. That's the job of the church, the Sunday school teacher, the bus worker. Right. Every single believer. Got it. It's the same. Let's make Christ known. Let's stand, Pastor, and you come. I'm going to ask our musicians to come so we can have a, an invitation hymn, and you just mind the Lord tonight. And uh, as we pause in this invitation time, if you're here and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you do not know if uh, you were to die today that you would go to heaven, you don't know that your sins are forgiven, we want to challenge you and encourage you to come and 
and know the Christ that we know, uh, the Christ that we've uh, endeavored to make known to you today in all of our services. Uh, if you need to be saved, there's today Today is the day of salvation as far as God is concerned, and he's, he's the one you should be concerned with, uh, with his timing. Don't presume that you can come next Sunday. Been a lot of folks who intended to get saved in another service, another day, another opportunity, and that day never was available to them. So we challenge you, encourage you to come to Christ and be saved. And then as a church, we've been challenged tonight. Um, thank God for the qualities of our church that are similar to the church at Ephesus. But we must guard ourselves and guard our hearts that we do not lose, we do not leave our first love. Your first love can't be the preacher. Your first love can't be the fellowship. Your first love can't be a thousand things that we enjoy that surround and are, are part of this. But first things first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these other things will be right. Christ Jesus is to have the preeminence. Quite a word. Not just priority, not just a high spot, not just something, but the absolute overwhelming place. Let's give it to him tonight, shall we? All right, let's 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 sing an invitation hymn and you use the altar. You Maybe God stirred some, some call in your heart tonight and you just need to surrender to it. You might not know all the if, ands, and buts. You might not know all the details, but you know that God spoke to you about being a missionary. You ought to come and make that known. Let the church body come around you and support you and pray with you as you sort through that. Maybe God made a place known on your heart that God's dealing with you and you need to surrender to that call tonight. Maybe it's not a call to a specific mission, uh, but maybe it's a call to preach. Um, whatever, the, whatever it is that the Holy Spirit of God is dealing with you about, it would be a good thing uh, to spend some time in the altar. It would be a good thing to share that with God's people, with your household of faith, and uh, let folks uh, come around, surround you in prayer and support. Uh, whatever the need is tonight, just mind the Lord as we sing. 365. There's not a friend like the Lord. pause for just a moment in the uh, singing and uh, just take a moment and think about what we're singing. Amen. There's not a friend like Jesus. And uh, for someone to uh, lay down their life for you uh, because you're their best friend, uh, because you're their family member, we, we kind of get that. But for Jesus to come from heaven where he was adored And to lay down his life for those of us characterized by the scripture as enemies, there's just not a friend like that. He's the only one like that. And if you're not saved, you need a friend like that. It's the only friend that's going to bridge the gap. He is the only 
mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. God was manifest in the flesh in the Lord Jesus Christ so that he might take the hand of the sinner and the hand of the Heavenly Father and bring us together. Boy, we've been reminded tonight of our responsibility to make Christ known. So I want us to take that heed of that uh, admonition, that uh, expectation that we've received from the Lord tonight. God expects us to make Jesus known. I uh, need to make some commitments tonight. A uh, trip to an old-fashioned altar is just the start. It's kind of like salvation, not the end. It's the beginning. That's why the Bible speaks of it like a, a, a birth, being born again, a new birth. It's just the beginning of a new life in Christ. And the trip to the altar is not the end of your commitment. It's the beginning. That, that's that's where, you, where you make a decision, determination of the will, but then uh, you need to follow that up with a schedule of when are you going to obey what God stirred in your heart tonight? God stirred in your heart to be a better witness in 2023? Well, you better get it on the schedule. When are you going to go soul winning? God stirred in your heart. I'm going to do something about in my prayer life different than I've done. Um, Brother Myers did a great job in Sunday school presenting to us some thoughts on uh, praying about uh, some specific things on a daily, uh, each day of the week. And uh, now you can hear that and say, my, that was good. And God bless you, Brother Myers. And it be gone. Or you can settle in and say, Monday, I'm going to pray not only for my own money and finances, but I'm going to pray for other people struggling around me with money and financial problems. I'm going to pray for missionaries that need money to get scriptures to the field so that they can distribute them. And you can take that right on through. Tuesday, you're going to pray about trials and troubles and temptations that you face. And you're going to remember that missionaries face those same trials and temptations and troubles, but they're just multiplied many times over because they're away from family. They're away from their home church. They're away from the support that we take for granted. I'd like to preach this whole outline there. I think I will pretty soon. Uh, but uh, that is a tremendous thought of praying through these different uh, uh, areas. And what I'm saying is, if you don't plug in and plan some time to work that, it won't get done. All right, let's sing sing one one verse of that song, and let's let's just think about what a what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask you to be seated for just a moment. Uh, we do need to take care of one little item of business uh, in our evening service, and that is receiving the offering. Amen. Uh, we, we might bypass some other things, but we're not going to slip out of here without an offering, especially when we have in mind that some of you may not have become prepared or may have prepared and come tonight um, uh, for that very purpose to give and be a blessing to our missionary friends. And uh, I mentioned this morning, and I'll say it again, I, I never have an issue on this side of the equation of asking you to give generously and faithfully like you do. It's not like I'm pleading with folks who aren't generous and have a heart to give, but uh, just uh, let's, let's make sure we take care of the, our missionaries and be a blessing to them. I never have an issue with uh, pleading with you to do the best you possibly can in supporting the, the work of God through our missionaries. God has given us a wonderful missions team, and uh, it's just a, a, a blessed opportunity when we get to have our missionaries home for just this little little respite with us. And uh, we want to send them on their way rejoicing. 
And uh, part of that is being in our place and encouraging them by being here. I hate the thought of a missionary coming and to report to a supporting church and they go away thinking, Ooh, we better get some more churches online. I don't think that one's going to be here long. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like for them to leave our church saying, well, we, we feel pretty good about that. Uh, let's pray for them. Uh, let's ask the Lord to keep them going in that direction and doing the right thing. So let's be a blessing to them tonight. And uh, so we'll have our offering at this time. All right. All right. Amen. Well, it has sure been good to be in church together today. And it's just uh, uh, kind of one of those services where you hate to have the final prayer and, and go home. Well, the good news is when we have a final prayer on this side, we're just going to invite you to come over next door and we're going to we're going to bring all that good food from this morning back out, spread it on the table and go at it again. Amen. And uh, so hopefully uh, hope you'll be able to stay and, and enjoy another um, a little bit of fellowship around the table, and we're certainly thankful for those who provided and prepared and and uh, placed the food. You know, there's a lot of work just getting all that food out on the table, amen. And then our ladies worked hard this afternoon getting it kind of consolidated and into the warmers and different various places. Uh, um, that uh, I appreciate that. It doesn't go unnoticed. I know sometimes it, it goes unrewarded. It's not like I'm going to give you a $50 uh, Walmart card, ladies, but <laughs> but it's the thought that counts. Amen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, amen. Oh, my. But thank you. Thank you for being just being mindful of things. You know, I, I'll just be honest with you. Uh, and I, I want to say this in the right spirit. I'm, I'm not casting stones or being ugly. I'm just saying that uh, Miss Bambi and I have been in a lot of places where God has placed us, where if any of that work that got done this afternoon was done, it would have been Miss Bambi and I doing every bit of it. Now, you know my wife. She's going to be in the mix of it uh, regardless. You cannot send her away from a work detail. It's impossible. Um, myself, on the other hand, not, not so much. My like my big brother, my my uh, older brother Cleve. He had a little, several little funny things that he uh, messed with me as a as a kid growing up. He he observed that uh, work didn't bother me at all. And he said, nah, "I've seen you lay right down and go to sleep while I was getting the job done." So, uh, but uh, boy, it's been good to be here. Thank you for being a part of it. And if you possibly can stay a few minutes, even if it's just to go through and get a to go box and take you something home, maybe you got to get on in. And we understand that, but uh, if you can stay long enough just to uh, 
come through for a few moments, and that'll be fine as well. And uh, let let's pray, and uh, then we'll make our make our way over and have have another meal. All right, Father, thank you again for the good day and the blessing of being together in your house, and Lord the the good music and the uh, the good word of God that's been so clearly proclaimed to us today. Lord, we just rejoice in your goodness, and uh, Lord, we want to even now contemplate and consider how we'll follow up on how you've stirred our hearts tonight and throughout the day today. Lord, bless us and give us your leadership and guidance. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would uh, help us not to soon forget uh, what we've heard and what we've committed to today. We pray for your blessing uh, as we gather next door for the meal. And thank you for those who have, uh, have uh, worked today to make that possible. And we'll go through another session of work to make it happen again tonight. And we thank you that we can do that together in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.